Welcome to Round Hill Radio, the podcast from Round Hill Community Church. Through our conversations, we discover the holy and the ordinary, find moments of grace and peace, and redefine what we're talking about when we talk about faith. <laughs> Welcome to Round Hill Radio. I'm Leslie. I'm Ed. <laughs> Good morning, Ed. <laughs> Good morning, Leslie. <laughs> we're laughing because we're trying a new uh, recording platform and it's all a little weird so <laughs> and, and there was a scary looking countdown thing that popped up so. extremely official <laughs> extremely official like us i mean we're just more and more legit every day <laughs> every day in every way getting better and better <laughs> nice tie-in um because i i've been curious about this idea i don't know what pinged it in my mind but um, someone had mentioned this idea of, of, of resiliency mm. and, um, you know, as things are, I feel less optimistic than mm-hmm. I did a month ago. You know, I think, uh, I think I used the metaphor once when we were chatting in a meeting about, I felt like someone popped my balloon. Oh yes. Like my head, my head put energy and breath into plans and ideas and someone came along and Yep. Popped my pop my idea and plan balloon. They, <laughs> so I'm like, oh. they, yep, it really has been happening. We've been hearing a lot of those popping sounds in the last few weeks, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to like get your thoughts, and I imagine I'm perhaps not the only person feeling this way right I, now. I have to imagine that you are in <laughs> very very good company. Yes. Yes. I love the fact that you've mentioned this word resilience because I, I many many times during the course of the pandemic I thought of people living in very close quarters, maybe not able to get outside easily and talk about the resilience needed to go through that, through the pandemic and you know perhaps with a lot of young children in the home and you know they're wanting to get out and get exercise and how difficult that's been. So I think the popping sounds in the last few weeks have been that we thought like the air had gone back into the tires, right? And into the balloons. And I just, I kept hearing people four weeks ago say, oh, it feels so good to be out again and not wearing masks in all places. And now we're in a really different place and we're, it's evolving. It's evolving. And I, I just think uh, as always, we're, we're trying to keep a nice, non-anxious or less than anxious approach. But still, we we also know that school's right around the corner. Some, in fact, school has already started for many, many children across the country. So we're, we're feeling, how do we, how do we stay in touch with this? And I think the fact that a hurricane was moving up the coast, you know, was just yet one more thing, right? Uh, so I just, just a quick story about resilience. Um, when I was just out of college, I was living in the United Kingdom in a uh, in an urban area in Scotland, and it was a very very challenging place. It was the first time I'd really ever lived in a city, and uh, especially in a part of a city that just was so uh, under resourced in so many ways. I was spending the whole summer working with children, and uh, it was just so hard for me to kind of get up in the morning. The weather was horrible, you know, had everything against it. And someone said, you know, you ought to get out of town for the weekend and go down to a, to a monastery just south of Edinburgh and go on, go on retreat for 48 hours, kind of get your head clear. So I went down there and to this little monastery in the village of Nunro. And uh, it was it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I had a chance to talk with the abbot. So he's the leader of the monastery. And he was probably in charge of about, I don't know, 20 to 30 men living together 24-7, 365, just no way to get out of each other's way. And I'll never forget one night, he and I were sitting down and I said, what's your biggest challenge here? And he said, to help everyone stay supple. Right. So when you're living that close together, it's inevitable that like little tiny differences can be big differences. And then you think, oh, great, I'm going to be living with this person for the next 52 years. And how's that going to work out? So helping people to stay supple. I really like that. And uh, I think that's part of our challenge right now as we enter this next phase of the pandemic. And to me, you know, suppleness is trying to find a good way to breathe through the challenges that we have, because I do think we come equipped with great resources for resilience. Mm -hmm. We probably think that they can be, you know, 
exhausted at some point. But I like to believe that with breath flowing through our bodies and the ability to tap that inner energy, uh, we've been given more light than we'll ever use. But we really have to help help one another get there because obviously for some people it's going to be just incredibly challenging. But supple is a word that I really like to think about. You know, I had so many images flying through my mind when you were saying that. And the one I think I've landed on is the idea of a tree. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. as a child being very nervous in big wind, wind, wind storms because the trees would bend sure. and flex. And I was convinced they were all going to fall down. Right. Um, and and I lived in a very, apart. Yeah, I lived in a very wooded area as a child. And uh, my mother told me that, no, that's the sign of a healthy tree, that it can flex in the wind. And yes. even in uh, very, very tall buildings, actually, they flex a little bit in the wind. And they that do. is a, a strength. And that yes. rigidity and, and br brittleness is actually what can cause them to crack and fall. Um, so I think the yep. idea of suppleness is sort of all around us in ways that we maybe don't even notice that there's strength in flexibility, there's strength and suppleness that you don't think of when you think someone is strong and, and yeah. steadfast um, on the outside, but maybe they're soft and flexible on the inside. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. It is interesting, isn't it, though, that when something is supple, we find it kind of unnerving. Like we think that building should not be moving. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that tree should not be moving in the wind like that. Right. Um, but you're right. They're limber. That's the word that used to be used a lot, you know, or we used to talk about limbering up for an exercise uh -huh. and getting really loose. And uh, if I can just use a little tiny tennis analogy here for a moment, it's, of course. it is so interesting that in the last, I, I would say, especially five years, as I've talked with people who teach tennis and play tennis and some of them, you know, at a pretty high level, the word that has come into play I would say almost more than anything else is the word loose. You have to be incredibly flexible. And all they're all doing yoga. You know, they're all trying to enhance their flexibility. And that to me is kind of the cutting edge spiritual question for us now. What practices are there that we can use? Uh, I'll just give an example of one of my family members. I mean, she raised a lot of children when she was a young uh, mother. And her husband was involved in an incredibly engaging job. It was, uh, it, was, it was a very challenging time for them. But for about an hour or two after dinner, she would disappear into one part of the house and read mm. nonstop, solidly. And she had tasks for everybody that they had to do while she was off doing that. But I think that helped to keep her supple because otherwise she was under constant demand. And so the agreement in the household was for this period of time, you're just going to have to, everybody's going to have to find their own way and, mm -hmm. and really kind of be civil to one another and take care of the dishes and do everything that needs to be done because this, this person really had to have that time in order to be available elsewhere. And uh, so it's, it's supple time, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's a few minutes here or there, but I do find that breathing, deep breathing helps enormously because you can do five of those deep breaths and suddenly you feel a little less, you know, uptight, a little less rigid. Yeah. It makes me think of like, you know, what is the purpose of self-care? You know, we hear that mm. term out thrown around a lot. Yes. You know, so what, what, why do we, do, I mean, obviously we love a bath right? Like sure. it's time for yourself in and of you, itself, in and of itself is a beautiful thing. But what is the purpose of it? And I feel like for, for some of us, maybe it's, it, you feel guilty taking time for yourself, um, or all those things, but it, it speaks to this sort of, you know, intentional care, right? right? And whatever that looks like for you. So sometimes yeah. maybe that's a walk. Maybe that's going and playing tennis. Maybe that's reading a book. Maybe it's doing yoga. Um, another monastery story. I do have stories that don't involve monasteries, I love but, it. it's but great. here's another one. So this was told by a wonderful woman who's been teaching at Drew University at the School of Theology for years. And she, in early in her career, she had, she also had a family. She was working full time. She was teaching at Drew. I mean, it was just r ridiculous. That's what she was trying to do. And someone said to her, you know what? Her name is Heather Murray Elkins. They said, Heather, you got to get out of town. 
get, like for our sakes, get out of town for a couple of days. So she went to, uh, to a monastery to have a little retreat. She got in, of course, she brought a ton of work with her, right? She wasn't going to go on any kind of retreat without a lot of work. So she, sp- she got in her rooms, got all her stuff spread out. And there's a knock at the door. She opens up the door and here's one of the nuns. And the nun has a tray. And on the tray, there's bubble bath and a glass of wine. And Heather Marie Elkins looked at her and said, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> and the nun looked at her and like without skipping a beat, just said, it's really true. You Protestants don't believe in grace. <laughs> So there it is. <laughs> Even I love when, we're ha- when it's handed to us on a platter, a we don't platter. want it. My Presbyterian heart feels that really deeply. <laughs> I'll bet it does. I'll bet it does. Oh my God. A great story. That's I mean, an amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just oh the opportunity to be supple isn't even on the, on the screen. No, no. Yeah. No. So I love it. Oh, there's an, <laughs> <laughs> I love, cause I think you, you know, we, we put up these walls, these walls of work and these walls of busyness and everything and, and sort of knocking them down requires a certain, a certain like vulnerability, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. I think that's just the word we've, we've talked before about uh, the author Brene Brown and how she's, I think, single-handedly helped to reintroduce the power of that word vulnerability into our sure. language. And uh, gosh, we're such a, you know, we, we're a driven people at almost, even when we're trying to do good, we're driven. And, um, but rather the question is how do we, how do we be vulnerable enough to actually let the spirit get to us and move through us. And I've really been kind of working with this now for a number of months because I'm very concerned about the environment. I'm curious to know what it is, what kind of contribution that I can make towards helping in whatever way I can, you know, to position things in a better way for future generations. Um, but that, that I, and I'd love to just have it all mapped out. One, two, three, here, Ed, here's what you do, go do it. But it seems that the spirit is taking its sweet time with this. So I decided to say, okay, I'm going to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And that does require a certain vulnerability. And uh, I just think of a a comment that was made to me many, many years ago by a lovely woman, Gertrude, who was a member of my congregation when I served in New Hampshire. And I had used a prayer that I thought was a really beautiful prayer that began with the words, oh, vulnerable God. And she came up to me after the service and she said, what in the world do you mean by that? And I said, so Gertrude, I guess vulnerability and God don't go together for you. And she said, no, I cannot go there with you. For her, God had to be invulnerable in a certain way, I would say almost inflexible Mm -hmm. in order to simply be, you know, because what are the words we use? A rock, a sure foundation, all of those very, very strong, stable images. Now, there's a role for that, for sure. But um, Martin Thornton, who was a Church of England minister, wrote a book once called The Rock and the River. Mm. And he said the key thing is God, like the church, has to be both. There are times when you have to be firm and offer a sense of stability, but you also have to find a way to be flexible and vulnerable. And that's you know, the core of the Christian story is that's how God chooses to enter the world through through the vulnerability of people, through a baby. I mean, sort of like the ultimate act of vulnerability. And uh, so I think in these days, especially as the pandemic's evolving, when we feel vulnerable and feel like flexibility could be a weakness, maybe this is a time to just pause for a moment, say, no, maybe maybe flexibility is just the thing that's needed right now. And uh, and I know that many people are eager to get back to sort of the, that stable schedule where you know it's going to just stay that way for, you know, whatever. A, a week would be great, right? <laughs> Let alone a year. Right. Um, but maybe in this evolving time, we're, we're learning, we're kind of, bec- we've become students again. Uh, and I'm just thinking uh, of how many times we're thinking about preparing worship for the future. And, you know, one week it's this, and then the next week maybe it's that, and two weeks it's something else. And 
It takes it takes a certain energy to go with the flow. We like to say that, but you know, you have to to go with the flow means that you really have to be dedicated to that. And uh, it takes a kind of commitment or resolve, but I also think there's a lot of joy that comes with it because there's some good surprises that can happen too along the way. Yeah, that's a really interesting silver lining. I had I hadn't anticipated our conversation going to, but that idea that if we remain open and, and flexible and supple, that it, it opens us up to to mm. small joys or big joys or anything in between. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to just quickly highlight that what you had said a little bit ago is one of the things that I I I lift up as one of my favorite things about being part of this community is the fact that I think we operate from a place of vulnerability. We operate mm. from a place of, we don't have all the answers. Like, I feel like there's a temptation mm. in leadership to say, I have the answers, follow me. I know everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that we are a community that we say, none of us have the answers and you facilitate conversation and curiosity. Um, I think that's one of the many things, but I feel like that for me is the, one of the biggest things that makes this community feel so special and like kind of a unicorn in a world where everyone's <laughs> the, and, you know, the armchair expert. And uh -huh. we look around and we say, I don't see any experts here, but let's talk about it and learn together feels, yeah. uh, unusual and excellent, I have to say. Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning that. I think that's very true. I certainly treasure that. And don't take it for granted, you know, I, and try not to take it for granted. I think that's a quality that doesn't, you know, especially right now as the hard lines are being drawn around mm -hmm. many different kinds of issues, everything from vaccinations to mask wearing and politics. Um, I think that suppleness and curiosity are the way through towards greater unity. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as we remain on other sides of our lines without the willingness to open openly say, I don't understand your position. Can you help me to understand it? Can you tell me why you feel so passionately that way? Uh, can I tell you why I feel so passionately about my perspective? If we can't get to that place, then we're not supple. And if we're not supple, as you pointed out, then we're going to be brittle. And that's where a lot of breakage happens, brokenness happens. So I think that we can move past that. And we have the resources to do it. We've been shown by the great religious teachers of the centuries how to do that. And so let's, uh, let's follow the spirit here and see how it leads us to open ourselves in a more vulnerable way to one another and to the world. Absolutely. And we also want to encourage you, our audience, to join us in conversation. Or if you have anything you're curious about and want to hear Ed's thoughts and my fumblings about, uh, feel free to shoot our us. Mutual a, fumblings. Our mutual fumblings. <laughs> We're graceful over here. Um, feel free to shoot us an email at podcast at roundhillcommunitychurch.org. I know it's long. It'll self-correct. Um, and then I also wanted to, before we finish up today, I wanted to uh, announce our newest uh, book club selection. Um, yes. We on, on September 21st. So our fearless listeners, you have a month to read it. Um, if you are watching on the video, I'm going to show it now. It is blissfully thin. <laughs> <laughs> a person like me who has a bedside table stack of books, this will be good friends with your other books. It is called Art and Faith or Art Plus Faith, The A Theology of Making by mm. Makoto Fujimura. Um, and I showed Ed some book club's options this morning, and I wish I could replicate the sound he made. It was like I showed him a chocolate cake. So, exactly the same sound. <laughs> the same sound. <laughs> so we are excited to uh, be in conversation with you guys about this. As you are reading it, please shoot us any questions, any thoughts. We'd love to mm -hmm. read them uh, in our next in our podcast. So that will be for September twenty first. We are now on a Tuesday uh, publishing schedule. As long as I can keep it up, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Things change. We're supple. 
Um, we are. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to read this and discuss it with you. So thank you, Ed, so much for tackling this topic. I have a feeling a lot of what we've talked about today is kind of kind of weave its way into conversations over the next months uh, for sure. But it was, I hope it was helpful to all of our listeners. I know it was helpful to me. Me too. Me too, Leslie. Blessings to everyone. Thanks for listening. Round Hill Radio is brought to you by the friends and members of Round Hill Community Church. For more information, please visit roundhillcommunitychurch.org.